Thank you, Rodrigo, and thank you, Simon. So as Rodrigo said at these meetings, I largely echo what uh, Edmund has already said, as you can see, but uh, with one uh, major difference that uh, we have not been able to reconcile over all these uh, 20 plus years that we have been uh, collaborating. <laughs> and this difference you can uh, hear as soon as we open our mouth is in the very rich vowel system that Edmund has compared with my poor Italian seven vowels. <laughs> and uh, what I want today, to do today is to, to try to look at the origin of this uh, difference. And uh, you can see immediately from this uh, from these uh, slanted grids that I want to, to connect that with the grids that we are more familiar with. So I will take it from the very beginning. I think this is the fifth day and uh, we can, uh, we can uh, declare it a hand-waving day if uh, Andreas is, uh, <laughs> is happy with that. So I, I'll take it from the fifth day after creation asking <laughs> How, <coughs> how uh, uh, did it uh, start this uh, difference that is now expressed between, uh, between uh, Edmund and me? And uh, how the human uh, language faculty emerged? We know that it was not a process of uh, throwing dice. It's... Uh, it has been uh, declared uh, not what, uh, what the Almighty does. But there are maybe two different games that uh, we can uh, uh, focus on as uh, key stages in the evolution of the human nervous system. The first game is like the three-card game. is when, um, uh, if you want, the Almighty selected among the three classes of vertebrates. The mammalian, uh, the mammalian class, and then the human species among the mammalian uh, The mammalians is a kind of roulette. And I want to kind of talk a little bit in a hand-waving manner about these two processes by plotting them on this, uh, on this uh, kind of silly graph where I have just two axes, structure and function. And I, I would argue that the the first process can be understood by putting this uh, kind of uh, uh, three of the advanced vertebrate classes in this uh, vertical orientation, where in red you see mammals, and uh, in blue and green reptiles and birds. And then the evolution of among mammals continues but with a slanted tree that, uh, <coughs> that produces the variety of mammals or of mammalian brains that uh, we see today. And why this, uh, why this inclination? Because I would argue that uh, the, first, uh, the first game, the first step that I want to focus on is uh, a kind of uh, structural phase transi transition, which uh, I plot as a vertical line, is a sharp uh, transition in the structure of the brain to which there is no corresponding functional transition. And the second process that I want to focus on is uh, instead uh, a transition that I plot as an horizontal line is a kind of functional phase transition to which there is no corresponding structural transition. Now, when we talk about the language faculty, we tend to think of this uh, second uh, uh, transition as the, the key process to understand. But I would uh, argue today that for the system of vowels that I, I want to focus on, in fact, we should go back to 
very early stage, even before uh, the structural transition has taken place. So let, let me go a bit in order and let, in reverse order, and let me say a few things about this uh, uh, functional transition first, the one that comes second. <coughs> so the, <coughs> the riddle of how is it that, that uh, humans and bees are so similar <coughs> in every respect, except for things like language, is a problem that has, has uh, interested people from the time of King Solomon. And uh, <coughs> it has been uh, addressed in a clear-cut fashion only in recent times by proposals by theoretical linguists that uh, there is something in the, in the human brain, a language acquisition device, a LED, that comes ready, hardwired, with the um, uh, ability to express language. It has uh, embedded this uh, universal grammar that then can, uh, can uh, I'll just let, let me go through this slide, can then uh, <coughs> take the specific forms of specific grammars. So this proposal was in uh, uh, sharp, uh, kind of contrast to what people already knew from classical neuroanatomy from the time of Ramonica Hall, that uh, nothing, no extra device is seen in the human brain that is not in the brain of our uh, close relatives, at least. So there was a, really a, a change of position on the part of, uh, of uh, theoretical linguistics into a new proposal that uh, what distinguishes the human brain is not really a, an additional device, is something more <coughs> abstract, is a process, maybe some kind of software that uh, at least at some point, Chomsky and colleagues have uh, called infinite recursion. And there is a, a nice review paper in 2002 where uh, this idea of infinite recursion is uh, illustrated uh, in words, but mainly in one figure, which is a kind of, uh, of uh, uh, elegant, neat description of, uh, of the basic proposal, at least at that time. And is this a picture here, where the faculty of language FL is uh, decomposed into a core and a surround. In the surround, there are the sensory motor organs that uh, they say may be specialized for language in, in humans, and also the conceptual intentional system that maybe in humans have par are particularly uh, adapted uh, to the language faculty. But uh, those are all uh, decorations, if you want. What is uh, unique to humans in this, uh, in this uh, proposal in the, in the paper of, in science in 2002 is the faculty of language in the narrow sense. And it's described in this diagram where there are uh, a number of pieces that here are words, but in general are elements from a finite set, could be words, could be phonemes, could be larger uh, chunks of speech, that combine according to some rules. They fit like Lego pieces. And using a, f a set of rules to combine these elements into sequences that could be arbitrarily long is what they, they call an infinite recursion, at least in this paper. In other papers, infinite recursion means something else. But in this paper, it means the process uh, illustrated in this uh, figure. Now, it's interesting for our uh, discussion that uh, neurophysiologists like Moshe Abeles have uh, seen or uh, have thought they have seen in the monkey brain, in the frontal cortex, something like a sequence of discrete states that is at least reminiscent of uh, this uh, process of chaining discrete elements into, into a chain. So 
if we believe in this uh, correspondence, which has many, many kind of question marks, the Moshiabeles used the a complex hidden Markov model, some computer algorithm to extract these discrete states from his uh, neurophysiological data. But if we, we consider this correspondence, then, uh, <coughs> and we follow Chomsky's proposal that uh, infinite recursion is unique to humans, then we have to believe that what is really unique is the infinite property. Is that the sequence of states that maybe you see in the monkey, this is something that uh, Chomsky et al. say in the review, is, uh, is a sequence that can, uh, can go through maybe three, four, a few steps, but in humans it can be extended to infinity. This would be within the neuroanatomical uh, uh, observation co uh, that uh, the differences that, that uh, you see in the, in the cortical machinery are at best uh, small quantitative differences. So one, uh, <coughs> one would like to understand whether this, uh, this option of uh, producing infinite sequences that would come out of the Chomsky proposal could arise in some way out of a brain that is basically the same with uh, uh, quantitative uh, differences in the details of the microcircuitry. This is... Uh, uh, something that uh, I've looked at in a, in a, in a number of, uh, of papers that I don't want to discuss here. I've looked at models that produce these uh, so-called latching dynamics, uh, spontaneous uh, um, dynamics through a set of uh, discrete or quasi-discrete states. And I just have a slide to say that uh, these, uh, these uh, models are kind of a mathematization of some proposal by Valentino Breitenb Breitenberg to consider uh, the cortex of a mammal as a system uh, of uh, associative memories that are uh, uh, localized into patches of cortex with uh, connectivity inside the patch and long-range connectivity uh, uh, connecting different patches, and both these so-called A and B systems of synapses, in Valentino Breitenberg's view, would uh, um, implement associative memory at two different uh, scales. So this is, uh, <coughs> is uh, an idea that can be used to, to formalize a mathematical model that uh, um, it's a kind of POTS model that allows us to examine in, with, uh, with uh, mathematical tools this uh, um, idea that uh, the core element of the language faculty may, may be a phase transition towards a ability to produce infinite sequences. So it's something that I don't want to discuss today. I just put it up as an illustration of the possibility to, to look at these uh, very speculative ideas with mathematical models. But I just want to, before uh, leaving this, uh, this uh, idea of the functional phase transition, I want to, to relate it to uh, this uh, kind of uh, recent interest by neuroanatomists to understand if this, uh, <coughs> this uh, phase transition is uh, related to the size of the human brain, then the, the problem comes up of uh, that the, the human brain is not the largest brain we see among mammals. In volume, the brain of elephants and dolphins and whales is larger. And uh, in recent years, this is, uh, uh, is a problem that has been uh, tackled, particularly by Susanna Arculano Uzel, that, uh, who has questioned whether uh, people had really considered uh, the number of neurons as a potentially separate variable from the volume of the brain. 
And uh, she, she has pointed out that uh, if we look at the species we know uh, best, that have, have been subject to more detailed measurements, rodents and primates, while in primates the density of neurons per unit of volume is relatively constant so that uh, from smaller species with smaller brain to larger species with larger brain, you can take brain volume as a, as a kind of proxy of a number of neurons. In rodents, large rodents like the capybara have a very uh, uh, re uh, decre has, have a decreased uh, density of neurons so that uh, Capybara is a, a, a large brain in volume or weight, but uh, with uh, relatively few neurons. So Susanna Herculano Ozel has pointed out that if the same scaling laws would apply to elephants and whales, then uh, elephants and whales, although they have large brains, would uh, not have uh, more uh, neurons in the cortex than, uh, than the human brain. In fact, uh, more recent data has uh, um, produced estimates for elephants that in a sense uh, qualify but confirm uh, Susanna's uh, kind of uh, idea. It seems that uh, in the elephant, although there are, uh, there are uh, many more neurons in total than in, in the human brain, but they're mainly in the cerebellum, 97.5 of them. So in the cortex, the human cortex is, uh, has more neurons. With whales, there is a <laughs> Yeah, we're safe. <laughs> but with, that may be too early to express relief. With whales, instead, the evidence is contradictory, and somebody has produced estimate for one species of whales that would have more cortical neurons than the human. So we wait to see how this uh, story develops. But now I want to, to go back to the other uh, transition that I mentioned. So this, uh, this uh, functional transition we leave for the moment and we go to the structural transition at the uh, differentiation between mammals and, uh, and the other uh, uh, amniotes. And uh, this is a transition that comes out very clearly from just looking at these, uh, um, at these uh, uh, slices, cross sections through the, the forebrain of a lizard. If we look at the, this rectangle, the dorsal pallium of the lizard in uh, mammals, becomes the isocortex, so even in a simple, relatively simple mammal like the echidna. The isocortex with its uh, neurons arranged over multiple layers. So that's one key difference between reptiles and mammals. The other difference we have to look inside in the hippocampus. We here see the cross section through the, the forebrain of several mammals. And uh, in this uh, picture, what corresponds to the hippocampus is this uh, medial pallium that in the lizard is just a simple sheet of, um, of cells on one hemisphere facing the other hemisphere. In uh, mammals, if we take the platypus, becomes uh, the hippocampus we are familiar with, with the three sub main subfields, the entagyrus, CA3, and CA1. So there is this uh, sharp difference between the medial pallium or hippocampal homologue of a reptile like the lizard and the hippocampus of the platypus. And the hippocampus of the platypus is essentially identical to that of a rat or a cat or a human. I can superimpose the images without moving the labels for the subfields because it's really the same organization despite the changes in, uh, in uh, size of the structure. So we can say that the second key difference between amniotes is in the medial uh, pallium 
which reptiles have in a different, simpler form than mammals, and birds is yet a different form, but is a different uh, uh, direction, different complexification from the one undertaken by mammals. Yet, this uh, uh, kind of sharp change in the structure of the brain does not seem to go along with a change in, in the cognitive function associated with this uh, part of the brain. This is from a, a review paper of a few years ago, by a Spanish group, where they list a number of references, these numbers, that uh, indicate that uh, these different classes of vertebrates, they share similar cognitive mapping strategies, and the hippocampal pallium or the medial pallium is involved in place learning in all three classes of vertebrates and is not involved in uh, so-called Q learning. And also at the system level, this uh, medial pallium, which is as, as different internal circuitry, but at the system level, it shares many of the same features. It shows neurogenesis, if anything, reduced in mammals. It shows the presence of zinc, still choline, recurrent networks, and as we said, spatial memory. In particular, with regard to spatial memory, there is this, uh, this uh, Spanish group of Rodriguez et al. that have shown with very elegant experiments that are the analog of the Morris water maze, that if you lesion the medial pallium in a tur turtle, you have a deficit in finding <coughs> the escape out of a pool, similar to a water maze, in a kind of, a, of a replication in reptiles of a classical hippocampal uh, dependent task. But more amazing is that you can do the same also in fish, and also you have a deficit in spatial memory. And it's, it's amazing because in fish undergo a different developmental process. Instead of evagination, the popping out of the hemispheres, fish undergo this process of aversion. The neural tube opens up at the top. So the result is that what in, uh, in mammals and reptiles and birds is the medial pallium, the region in black, our hippocampus. In fish, comes, the homolog region comes to, to be positioned at the lateral uh, aspects of the forebrain. So the region in black in fish is at the lateral. And yet, if you lesion that region, which is homolog to our hippocampus, but in fish is not, is not cortical, it's completely uh, kind of different uh, internal circuitry, yet it is involved in spatial memory in much a similar way, at least if we believe the, this uh, uh, work by the group in Sevilla, much the same way as it is in mammals. So amazing conservation of function in the face of a sharp transition in the structure, in the internal structure of the hippocampus. Then what it is that uh, turtles and goldfish clearly do not have that we have? Well, the dentagyrus. The dentagyrus is really the mammalian uh, contraption, the new device that uh, was invented in uh, mammalian evolution at the differentiation from our uh, reptilian ancestors. So now it's, I think it's beginning to be understood how it is set up genetically, but I don't want to discuss things that I don't, don't really understand. I just want to put up as an authority on this issue the diagrams by Georg Stritter, who <coughs> uh, shows this homologue structure in lizards, birds, and mammals, the, the uh, feature that is uh, uh, really unique to mammals is the fact that the, there is this input region to the hippocampus, the dentagyrus, which is made up of uh, interneurons. They are excitatory interneurons. They're interneurons in the sense that they do not project outside of the structure. This is in, in contrast to, to uh, the hippocampal homologue in lizards and birds. <coughs> 
One, uh, uh, particularly, I think, illuminating uh, uh, species is the opossum, where if you cut cross-section of the forebrain from the more rostral A to, to the more uh, uh, caudal posterior H section, you see this uh, evolutionary transition from a kind of reptilian hippocampus to the mammalian hippocampus in different uh, sections. In the, the anterior forebrain of the opossum is like it, it still thinks of being a reptile, if you want. So you see there is a, there is a, a in the medial pallium, we see just the, the kind of what would be the left hemisphere, there is a slight uh, in, um, sulcus, the hippocampal sulcus, which deepens if you go to more posterior sections, and then you see the full-fledged mammalian uh, internal architecture of the hippocampus. So in these species, we see evolution like uh, frozen in different uh, uh, sections. And this uh, <coughs> indicates that uh, it's a further indication that this uh, new chip, which is the mammalian hippocampus, it's not probably not adding any radically new style of information processing. It's, it's probably adding some improvement to a basic memory engine or spatial memory engine that somehow functions also without the dentagyrus. If there can be this, uh, this uh, um, transition even in one species. So, <coughs> Briefly, I want to just use uh, slices, slides from, uh, from Erika Cerasti to just uh, uh, hand wave some of the uh, modeling work that we have uh, done trying to, to um, <coughs> understand uh, this uh, role of the dentagyrus in uh, quantitative terms. So <coughs> the idea is to, to address these uh, uh, riddle that he, if, you, if you start adding the si main systems of connections to the hippocampal uh, circuit, there is this riddle that uh, CA3 is this uh, region dominated by recurrent collateral connections that receives the axons of the dentagyrus, of the dentagyrus uh, granule cells, but also receives direct cortical projections, the so-called perforant path in yellow. And this perforant path is a set of fibers that have already made on their way the inputs, input connections to the dented granule cells. So what the dented granule cells can uh, tell CA3 is essentially, at least to a fast approximation, what CA3 cells can already acquire fast end directly from the, per, from the perforant path. It appears that the dentagyrus duplicates information that CA3 already receives directly. So there is this, uh, this thing that from a point of view of uh, some information engineer is a kind of uh, riddle that uh, we should try to understand. And uh, in quantitative terms, uh, these systems of connections are very different, as pointed out uh, many years ago by Amaral and colleagues. The perforant path direct cortical connections uh, have many synapses per cells, although fewer than the recurrent collaterals. These are estimates for a certain strain of rats. The mossy fibers are the direct uh, connections from the dentagyrus to CA3, they are uh, very few in number, but they are special synapses thought to be strong and uh, not to be plastic or to show a different kind of uh, plasticity from the, the more standard one of the other two systems. So the idea that uh, Erika explored in her, uh, in her PhD thesis 
was based on the notion advanced by uh, David Marr and Bruce McNaughton and Edmund that uh, CA3 can be understood through a fast approximation as an auto-associative network, a bit like the off-field model, where input patterns produce uh, uh, transient cell assemblies that are then embedded in the connection strengths between the units and different patterns would lead to strengthening a different set of connections, such that later a partial Q would uh, bring about the, the retrieval of uh, one of these uh, cell assemblies. So this is a process that had been studied, but what really has been studied is this retrieval process, is how retrieval from partial Qs can be possible in such a uh, in such a, a recurrent network and under what conditions. And people have estimated the storage capacity, the maximum number of, of patterns that can be stored and retrieved in this way. But the off-field model has not really addressed the problem of how to generate the initial representations, how to construct the cell assemblies from the, the inputs that uh, the network receives. And uh, in fact, uh, <coughs> that is uh, a problem in terms of information processing because a recurrent network is subject to interference from the memories that are already stored in the network. And this interference uh, uh, makes it difficult to embed new memories with uh, novel information. So, it has been pointed out that there is a need for mechanisms that uh, differentiate storage from retrieval. This is a, a problem of, a generic problem of recurrent network. And uh, maybe a, a generic uh, way to address it is the uh, so-called acetylcholine hypothesis that Mike Asselmo has, has, uh, has uh, pushed, promoted uh, very effectively, which is a, a kind of a, a neurochemical uh, device to differentiate storage and retrieval by uh, suppressing transmission and enhancing plasticity essentially at the recurrent connections in a recurrent network so that during storage these connections are, are more plastic, but are less dominant in the dynamics of the network. This is a, <clears throat> is a mechanism that uh, uh, probably uh, is uh, effective also in CA3, but is not a mechanism specific to the hippocampus, and is, in fact, uh, the, the uh, initial studies of Mike Hasselmo were in, uh, in uh, piriform cortex. It's a, a probably a, a generic uh, partial solution that uh, evolution has found to this uh, core problem of how to uh, establish representations in a recurrent circuitry. And uh, the idea that uh, maybe you, we can try to find it in the seminal papers of, by David Marr, but it's not really there, although maybe it was just uh, behind the corner of Marr's thoughts. And uh, maybe Bruce is, is, the, is the one that really uh, first uh, expressed in some way with this idea of detonator synapses. The idea is that in the, in the hippocampus, on top of the acetylcholine mechanism, there is another mechanism that is this, uh, this new trick of the dentagyrus as a separate pre-processing stage that is particularly active when there is a need to store a new representation and forcefully imposes this new representation in CA3. So the idea would be that the, <coughs> the meaning of the duplication, the, the same information that comes from the cortex and gets to CA3 both directly and through the dentagyrus is because the dentagyrus gives it the extra kick that makes it the dominant force when there is to encode the new representation. So this is something that we have explored with Edmund with the, with the models. I don't want to go into the details of the model, but just to, to, 
to point out at the kind of prediction or hypothesis that if the MOSI fiber inputs are those that uh, are essentially required to establish a new representation and are not so important when uh, the representation, the memory is already there in CA3, because then would be the perforant path inputs that uh, relay the queue that initiates the retrieval process. Then the, the prediction would be that he, if you remove the MOSI fiber, so you remove the inputs from the dente gyrus to CA3, you should not impair the retrieval of memories that are already in CA3. And there are a, a, at least a couple of uh, papers, this is from Jean-Michel Lassalle from Toulouse, like Simon. It's a very nice paper that uh, for me came out of the blue where they use elegant procedure with mice using a drug DDC that is, uh, is supposedly a drug that uh, blocks transiently transmission selectively on the MOSI fiber. So it's a drug that for, say, an hour, 45 minutes, makes MOSI fibers onto CA3 cell not transmit, and then washes out and the system is not damaged, it returns to normal. So they administered this drug every day before uh, sessions in which the, these mice were uh, we're learning the position of a, ma of a platform in a Morris water maze. And uh, <coughs> in the top diagram, there is an index of learning that shows that control mice without any injection of the drug, or this other control is mice that were injected another drug, EDTA, that supposedly has the same kind of systemic effects but does not cross the, the blood-brain barrier, so it should not block the transmission on the MOSI fibers. Both these control groups, they learn the position of the platform with this, as shown by this index of learning. Whereas uh, mice that were given this DDC, this uh, drug that blocks transmission supposedly selectively on the MOSI fibers, they could not learn the platform. And then the more interesting uh, uh, result is in the, in the bottom uh, plot, where in white is they reversed the two drugs in the second week. Mice that had been given DDC, the effective drug, in the first week, the second week they were given the ineffective drug, EDTA, and they could learn the position of the platform. This is what we expect. What uh, is the important result is the black bar that shows that mice that were given the ineffective drug the first week, so they could learn the position of the platform during the first week, when the second week they are given the effective drug that blocks transmission of the MOSI fibers, they can still remember where the platform is. So supposedly they can retrieve information that is already in CA3. So this is a, an experiment that kind of uh, suggests that indeed the role of the dente gyrus for uh, CA3 is limited to the storage phase. Kind of a different uh, uh, type of experiment was by Ina Lee and Raymond Kessner, 2004. They used instead, instead lesions. They use two dif different types of lesions. Le uh, standard lesions of the dente gyrus on the left is, a, is a, an estimate of how much of uh, dente gyrus in black or CA3 or CA1 was damaged by these lesions. So they, they claim that they essentially removed the dente gyrus without uh, touching much of CA3 and CA1. And then they use another uh, lesion that I'm not competent to say how, how precise it was, but they claim that they could remove the perforant path fibers after they've gone through the dente gyrus, just the part that makes synapses onto the apical dendrites of CA3 cells. So they could, uh, in this, with these two different lesions, they could either remove the dented inputs to CA3 or they could remove, with the other lesion, the perforant path input to CA3, but leaving the perforant path fibers 
in the portion that uh, just connects to the dentate gyrus. So amazing if they could really do that, but in a sense, uh, the proof comes from the pudding. So let's see what, what is the result. That uh, <coughs> they used uh, this kind of dry maze where with rats, rats uh, had to go from a, a start box to a, a goal box, and uh, they counted the number of, uh, of uh, wrong turns and, uh, and uh, entrances to the wrong uh, corridors that these rats would make. And so the basic uh, behavioral variable is the number of errors over uh, uh, repeated trials during uh, uh, like three days. So they tested rats, control rats, rats with had the lesion of the dental gyrus and rats that had the lesion of peripheral path. So the, the two lesion groups, they could still learn as shown by a decrease in, in errors in this uh, central plot, although their performance was every day worse than the, the control rats with no lesion. But then they looked at these two indices, which are very interesting, very uh, mathematically elegant, acquisition index and retrieval index. They both measure how much errors decrease from a set of five trials to the next set of five trials. But in the case of the acquisition index, is from the first five trials in a day to the last five trials in the same day. So it's the errors T1, 5, minus the errors in T6, 10, in the case for, for day one. Okay, so it's whether there is progress in running in the platform during a day. In the case of the retrieval index, it's the same thing, but comparing the last five trials of a day with the first five trials of the next day. So there is uh, the, uh, the night and this, in general the sleep phase in between. So it's, it's mathematically the same uh, kind of uh, uh, function, but just uh, shifted by half a day. Then the result is that uh, if we look at the acquisition index, rats with the dented lesion, they are the bar in the middle, have significantly worse acquisition that e than either control rats or rats with perforant path lesion. Whereas uh, if you look at the retrieval index, rats with the perforant path lesion are, uh, do not make any progress during the night, as it were, whereas uh, rats with the dented lesion, they are the same as control rats. So this study for me is amazing because there are so many questions about the lesion procedure and whether these two indices really are kind of uh, uh, probing these two di different dimensions of acquisition and retrieval, but it's so amazing that with all these questions that one can ask, the result shows this, uh, this very uh, uh, clear double dissociation where removing the dentate produces a deficit in the acquisition, in learning, and removing the perforant path produces a deficit in uh, retrieval, or at least in what they call retrieval, which could be the, related to the consolidation, who knows? but a, a double dissociation between these two um, uh, types of lesion. So I think this is, uh, uh, is uh, a kind of uh, nice supporting evidence for uh, this uh, specific role of the dentate in uh, acquiring uh, new information. But now I want to, <coughs> to move on to then what is the effect of having this, uh, this new mammalian device, the dentate, well, the effect can be seen, for example, in these nice uh, um, simple experiments by uh, Stefan and Jill Leutgeb uh, years ago in the Moser lab, where uh, <coughs> this is, would have been controlled data for, for an experiment that then uh, did, did not uh, work out. But in this controlled data, uh, rats were placed in a series of uh, boxes, A, B, and C. And uh, 
this is just an illustration of the known fact that uh, if you take a sample of uh, cells in CA3, you have that some cells in the sample may have uh, place fields in one room, uh, like A, there is a certain degree of reproducibility that the second time the rat goes in, uh, in room A, is called A prime, there is more or less the same, uh, same field for those cells that have a place field in A. Other cells have a place field in B, with uh, also a degree of reproducibility in the second visit to B. Other cells have a place field in C. If you look at the ensemble of cells that have a place field in A or in B or in C, and you take a simple measure of overlap, this is in the right diagram, relative to the case where, you visit again, where the rat visit again the same boxes, which is on the left of the diagram, then these overlap values as, as these baseline levels that are, say, between 0.6 and 0.1. So perfect reproducibility would be an overlap of one. In practice, this is a biological system. The, the real overlap is like 0.6, 0.7 for repeated visits to the same box. When you go to a different box, you see these two uh, different trends. CA1 is the, the um, markers in blue. It shows some intermediate degree of overlap, but we focus on CA3 where the degree of overlap between the representations of two different boxes A and B is a chance level. So the ensembles that are produced upon visits to different boxes, these are in the same experimental laboratory, are really completely different ensembles. It, it, it appears, if we connect it to the, to the previous idea, that the dente gyrus has been able to impose a completely new representation for these uh, boxes A, B, and C, even though in the experiment, Stefan and Gilles tried with, uh, both with boxes that were quite different in shape and, and size, and with boxes like in this, uh, when A and B are both square boxes that are of the same size, and they only differ maybe in the material or the color of the walls of the box. So e even for uh, environments that, that look uh, similar, if the rat can perceive that they are different, CA3 establishes completely different uh, representation. It's like the dente gyrus has acted as a kind of spatial random number generator to impart a completely different representation to, uh, invi to con special contexts that are uh, uh, similar. So we can, uh, we can uh, imagine that in, if, if you are a physicist in terms of this free energy landscape at the top where A, B, and C are kind of valleys, they are special valleys, they, are, they have a kind of quasi-flat bottom because they they have to allow for the encoding of many different positions within one box, but each box, A, B, and C, is a separate valley that has nothing to do with the other valleys. That's the situation in the hippocampus. It's uh, further clarified by this more recent uh, experiment by Charlotte Alm in the Moser lab, where she went to the kind of extreme of putting uh, rats into as many as 11 different uh, rooms that were all different uh, rooms in the Moser lab. So with, uh, <coughs> with pretty much the same uh, apparatus, this red crane and there are computers, there is a door. So each, each room looked to a human observer like me, pretty much the same as the other rooms. But if you look at cell in CA3, this is a typical cell, may have uh, place field in a few of the rooms in unrelated positions and in many of the rooms no place field. If you look at a larger sample of cells, there are uh, cells that are not here that do not fire in any of the rooms. There are many cells that fire in one or two of the rooms. And there are minority of cells that fire in, in have a place field in several of the rooms, but even when they do, the uh, place fields are in unrelated positions. 
So this kind of more uh, uh, extensive study drives home the fact that in, uh, in CA3 there is no similarity in the representation of even similar environment. Something that is not seen in CA1. CA1 does not receive these dented inputs, although it receives information from CA3. So it uh, supports the idea that the dented, as a new special mammalian device we have, enables us to store this really orthogonal representation, to use uh, a term that Edmund likes very much. So let's uh, go instead to uh, medial entorhinal cortex. In what happens in medial entorhinal cortex is the region that is just uh, adjacent to the hippocampus. One can ask what happens in the representations of medial entorhinal cortex when the rat goes into another box. With uh, cells in medial entorhinal cortex, you cannot uh, apply this uh, very simple overlap measure that uh, Stefan Leutgeb was using with the place cells in CA3 and CA1, because uh, here looking at uh, grid cells that we have already encountered in this school, the grid cells, they fire in many, uh, many different fields and in, in, in general in all environments. So if you just measure the, whether a cell is active in an environment, you, you find that all the cells that you have recorded are active in all the environments. So there is a need for a slightly more complicated mathematical procedure to measure really the similarity of the representation. Is this uh, uh, cross-correlation at the population level that I will not try to, to describe, but it's described in this uh, diagrams. The point is, if you make an autocorrelation at the population level, so you compare the representation in A with, the, with itself, with the same representation in A, you recover at the level of the whole population this uh, grid pattern that is the same grid pattern that you would, you would uh, see if you were looking at just the multiplication of the the firing map of one cell with itself. So the autocorrelation at the level of the population has the same grid pattern as at the level of a single cell. This is what we expect if all the cells that are recorded nearby in the tissue have the same spacing and orientation. That was an earlier result in the, the, with the discovery of grid cells. But if now you extend it to a cross-correlation between the representations of A and B, this is a kind of illustration where in, in part C you have first the autocorrelation and then the cross-correlation between the representations of A and B. <coughs> what you see is still a grid pattern, only shifted from the origin. That means that at the population level, there is a coherent displacement of the map. It is as if every cell displaces its grid map by a fixed amount that is common to all the cells. This is seen in this example, but you can take other examples. You always see the grid patterns uh, displaced. This was with trying with different boxes in the same room. In another uh, set of experiments, these are experiments by Marianne uh, and Torkel in the Moser lab. In another set of experiments, they looked at grid cells in two different rooms. So here is not just the box that varies, but the experimental room. And then when you do the autocorrelation in one room or repeated visits to one room, you find the grid pattern. And apparently, you don't find it when you do the cross-correlation between a representation of A and B. But Marianne and Torke realize that they have to try not just with the displacement, but also a rotation. If you, if you do this cross-correlation allowing for a rotation between the representation of the boxes in two different rooms, 
then you do find, to a good approximation in most of the cases, these grid patterns. That means that uh, there is uh, uh, a kind of uh, coherence at the population level in the representation of different environments, but a coherence that is subject to an arbitrary uh, dislocation, a shift, and an arbitrary rotation. Arbitrary in the sense that we don't understand its origin. This is, uh, can be expressed by saying that the, the local ensemble, we are talking about local ensembles of grid units, translates and rotates as a rigid structure, a bit like each each uh, uh, grid unit is a kind of sheet of uh, millimeter paper that is stapled to all the other sheets out of phase with each other, but they are stapled together. And when you go to a different environment, you just take the whole block of sheets to the other environment. You place it somehow uh, with an arbitrary sh a shift and rotation, but it's a, it's a, a rigid structure that presumably is kept together by recurrent connections. This is a kind of quasi-movie that Torkel produced some time ago that shows that if you try all different rotations, there is one at which you see the grid structure well. That means that there is a rotation at which the population coherence uh, shows up. So this idea of grid units as providing this kind of rigid metric of space. So, that means, and I, with this I, I conclude this first part, that means that uh, medial entorhinal cortex and CA3 really, uh, on the one hand, go hand in hand or go together. This is illustrated in this simple uh, uh, experiment in which uh, Marianne and Torkel trained rats to distinguish between two environments that were in fact the same, except that in one the lights were turned off. So the rats were was misled to believe that it was a different box. And then if you measure uh, the spatial correlation, a measure of, of whether the population activity in CA3 and in medial internal cortex is the same as in the lit box, when you, you turn uh, you, you, you place the rat in the, in the uh, lit box with lights, then you remove the rat, you place it back in the same box but with the dark, with the lights turned off. So the spatial correlations, both in CA3 and in medial internal cortex, they go to zero. These are two different rats. Then when the rat is there, you turn on the lights. So in the case of this uh, first rat, 11,554, then the spatial correlations immediately go up, both in medial internal cortex and in CA3. So this rat has immediately understood that this is now the lit box. The second rat is a bit slower, dumber. It does not understand that when you turn the lights on, you have to take him out and put him back in the box with the lights turned on, and then he realizes, yes, this, is, this was the box with the lights on. So, medial internal cortex and CA3 do the same thing. They switch from one representation to the other, but it is two very different kinds of switches. In uh, CA3, it's a complete replacement of one representation with another representation that has nothing to do with it. In medial internal cortex, as we have seen, is the shift and maybe rotation of uh, the same rigid structure. And as a result, in uh, CA3, if you measure, this is, well, let's, don't, don't bother, just uh, uh, listen to me. If you measure uh, the amount of information about which box you are, you can very easily read of which cells are active. From the identity of the cells that are active in a box, you immediately can read of which box the rat is in. In medial internal cortex, it's just not possible. You see the same cells, all the cells, all the grid cells are active, and they are active with the same coactivity relation. So only also if you look, look at the relation, this cell is firing at the same time as this other cell, this, whereas uh, cell C is firing uh, uh, in a different, in different uh, uh, time, 
if, even if you look at these relations, there is no way you can reconstruct which box uh, the rat is in. So in medial internal cortex, there is no memory for the context. So we conclude here because then in the next hour, I will completely change the story. <laughs>